the Grey Hat Beard podcast. Hello and welcome to Grey Hat Beard, the modern workplace podcast where we talk about all things Microsoft 365. Here we are at show 37, 47. I'm going to carry on. This is the third take on this. I'm just going to carry on with it anyway. Uh, I'm the Grey of Grey Hatbeard. My name's Kevin McDonnell. I'm the head of practice for Modern Workplace at uh, CPS and an Office Apps and Services MVP. My name's Al Eardley. I'm the Hat of Grey Hatbeard and I'm a technical architect in the Microsoft Technology Centre. And my name's Gary Trinder. I'm the Beard of Grey Hatbeard and I'm a modern work consultant at Microsoft. Not doing PMP or any of the other bits. I was going to say, that, that was very, that was yeah. very short. Yeah, that was far too short for you. Yeah. <laughs> I know, yeah. Well, I was well, just making up a little, you yeah. to tell us, yeah. So. <laughs> um, so, yes, here we are with uh, show 47. And uh, in the second part, which will be out next week, we're going to talk about design thinking. But in this part, we, we're going to talk, well... <sighs> We're going to talk about the latest news, but I'll be honest, if there's a barrel, we will be at the bottom scraping it. I think the only bonus I'll say is there's a lovely old whiskey barrel, um, so it'll have some good smells coming out of it. But we are definitely scraping it for news this week. I think post Ignite coming up to Christmas, uh, it's fair to say things are being stretched a little bit. Uh, but we'll have a good natter and uh, some good thoughts on the news that is out there. And kick off the the first bit of news, and this came out uh, today, which is around the we, we talked about this in the last news session about Microsoft lists and the offline capability and uh, posters come out um, talking about that and the, the kind of improvements it's brought down. So the, it's not just about that offline capability. There's a 57 percent improvement in page interactivity. Um, which is a uh, lovely, very precise number there. I think you could get some more decimal points going along with that. Um, intriguing to know what, what device that's on, wouldn't it? That's yeah, very maybe that's specific. an average. Yeah. Mm, that is intriguing. And what's page interactivity? So that sort of suggests clicking around and filtering and things like that. And, and I've, I've seen some of the, the stuff that's gone on with Microsoft List. It's definitely faster with you've got larger lists, smaller lists. It's definitely... Um, making it easier as well. But uh, I know they, they talk a bit about it and the progressive web apps, PWAs. This is not uh, project web apps or anything else that PWA seems to stand for Ooh. in many different places as well. Slash slides plus PWA. I know you used to love those, Al. Oh, um, absolutely. That comes to that. And, and the nice thing, if people haven't done this, is you can take the, the Microsoft lists app itself and install that as a windows app if you are on windows um within there and kind of pull it out from the browser and make use so there's some really really nice updates uh in there about it but i think what i found particularly interesting is when we, when we talked about this last week actually phil um i'm going to say worrell i'm hope i'm pronouncing that right um not not worrell worrell um it kind of commented on the show saying that it needed a lot of work and it's worth drilling into the docs um, that are available with it. So there's limitations on the kind of column types you need. I imagine managed metadata and things like that um, are going to cause problems. And the fact that even though it's offline, you can't add items, you can only edit existing ones. So it's definitely a few limitations um, with that. So just something to bear in mind. I, I have to admit, I was going to try and uh, use some of the scripts and spin out some large lists and give it a bit of a, a workout, but I uh, haven't, haven't quite had time to do that yet. But it was interesting to hear that feedback from Phil. So, uh, yeah, please, please do comment in the show notes, leave us reviews, things like that. We do read them and try and call them out uh, and would love to know what people think. I assume, Al, Gary, you, you had a fairly busy couple of weeks, haven't had a chance to look at all not really been playing with lists i mean i think it's one of, it's still one of those things that when we talked about it before you know we've had lots of scenarios <coughs> over the years where we want to take things on the road and be offline um you know lists in sharepoint have always been quite fun when you get to that five thousand item limit um but also you know those complex data types the rendering of them you know they've come a long way if you don't have all of that and you had to have limitations and that could be a real a real obstacle and it could push people down i guess other routes in terms of how they how they store that content and you know i guess the scalability 
in those scenarios, you know, do you want it as a, an offline app? What is the best technology to host it? Those will be interesting questions to to address. I think it was quite interesting looking at how they're doing it with the Project Nucleus. And they said they're going to be using a SharePoint executable that they're going to download using the same the same process as OneDrive um, for those those PWAs, the progressive web apps, which is quite interesting because they're not really talking about any of the mobile the mobile experience, which I think for offline, that's quite an important element. You know, do I go with the mobile devices rather than going um, with the full fat um, desktop that's got or laptop that's got all of the OneDrive capabilities and using that same delivery mechanism for the, the executables that will power it? And obviously you've got that offline capability and power platform, you know, is it really that much harder to certainly if you've got a key offline capability, would it make more sense to do it in power platform instead? I think that'll come down to license costs and and scalability yeah. and and complexity and also the skill sets. You know, we've got to remember there's a lot of fairly skilled SharePoint uh, developers or super users out there um, who you know who can put this stuff together quite quickly. Um, you know, and it is a it is a super user thing for SharePoint lists. It really is really easy to to create them now to make them really effective to automate them using Power Automate, you know, so there's lots of there's lots of benefits for using SharePoint lists where you do have that, sing, that, that single list rather than relational. It's obviously not a relational data source, is it? No, absolutely not. <laughs> yeah. I think it, this comes back to, again, having like the more the different options, right? The, um, you just said Power Platform, there's the SharePoint and base lists, um, you know, You've got the, the the list formatting as well, which is really powerful and getting even yeah. more powerful as well. Uh, it, I don't know if we mentioned it actually, but they released an update where there's a set value uh, function that's been added in now. And I know that there's a Just lot of... as you were saying there, I was thinking that was the other news yeah. I saw yesterday I forgot about. Yeah. That's true. Uh, which, we will add that to yeah. show notes as well. Which which then, you know, coming back to skill sets, if you've, if you've got, you know, your list on already defined in SharePoint, you're already using it, maybe you're in a migration scenario, that you've migrated a large list from on-prem into uh, SharePoint Online, and you could then start to just, you know, work on that data source, uh, you know, upgrade the visuals, add in like a, a small UI um, through those, those list formatting. You know, you're going to stick with that option rather than, you know, maybe lifting that up, going to Power Platform or, or having to learn power apps and then then build that that might be something that you get to later down the line um but it's nice to see where you've got all those different options to cater for all different scenarios i think um and and you know be able to uh yeah yeah updates really quick um one, one thing which i was going to say about microsoft the, 365 um, consultant says lots of options are a good thing yeah I don't, uh, I don't know. maybe that's yeah. just selling our services more but uh no i, I think genuinely right sorry gary <laughs> yeah um but I was, I was when you i uh, was looking through the uh the article um you know talking about pwas and uh it does actually in that article talk about onedrive as well and it wasn't until recently that I, I realized that OneDrive is a, P, a PWA as well. So I, I love using Outlook Web. I've got that as a P, PWA. So that's, you know, I pin that to my taskbar. So it opens the, the PWA version. I've also got OneDrive on there now. And I, I really liked, I really like this, this kind of uh, approach to adding these PWAs in there. Um, and I think this is the story that's kind of a couple of years in, in the making, really, because I remember a couple of years ago at Build, there were sessions with the Edge team. And obviously, Edge now is becoming, you know, that 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 de facto browser experience, certainly in Microsoft 365, where you're getting all these enhancements from Microsoft. And, you know, it, it's joined up between the, the uh, I guess, the engineering teams who are building the PWAs and then the Edge team who are also increasing the capabilities of what edge can do mm. from the pwa uh you know point of view so i think that's really being pushed by microsoft uh, and uh, you know i'd like to see more of these uh kind of coming about so I, I find them incredibly useful um so why the why what makes you use the kind of the OneDrive pwa versus kind of teams to find your latest files and things is that did you is it for getting the latest things you're working on or yeah i think it, it's you know, I, I tend to just, I, I guess, train still of open my browser and then I might go to OneDrive. It's nice just to have it there of, well, I'm going to the browser version and I, I can just click the OneDrive 
button mm. and get straight to the, the the interface so you know it depends where you're working um but um yeah i quite like the you know the extra benefits that you get um with the um different uh pwas like the outlook integration for example having that as your default mail it, it, it respects in email links and going oh i'll give you the outlook web version um mm. rather than the desktop or whatever um, so i think it's it's those ability to hook into other areas in the operating system yeah. like what we're seeing with lists right it's using a local process that's running on your machine through uh nucleus which is based on OneDrive. um you know it's able to 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 be a bit more intelligent uh with the, the hardware that it's running on or the the operating system it's running on and i would say to anyone who's listening if we lost you talking about PWAs and Nucleus and things like that, the great thing is you're going to get better performance offline and you don't have to think about any of that. So uh, good news all round for that one. Yep. No, I, I think, yeah, definitely the PWAs. I'm a big, big, big fan of those. Um, so I was doing a bit more searching and uh, was looking, as I say, really scraping that barrel. But I think I found something that's really quite interesting and hasn't been announced that much. So uh, I, I'm going to say very clearly, um, because obviously I have two Microsoft employees and an MVP. This was all found in public. I did not find this through any uh, things in there. It was via Apple News. I just looked. Uh, I, I have my Microsoft um, what's it called theme within there. And something caught my eye because it said Microsoft Flow Space. And I was like, Flow Space? Is, is this a new way of being able to visualize flows in mixed reality or uh, anything like that? But it appears to be an, an Office pod. And at first, I, I almost moved on because I thought, oh, it's another one trying to sell Microsoft stuff. But this appears to be a pod made by Microsoft. And um, it's not, not available for purchase. It was the, uh, was it the Office experiences team uh, sorry the microsoft envisioning center has come up with this concept pod so before you get too excited very much concept car um type space for it and it, it dug down into a link you can see a few photos i'm going to pop over to another link for those looking at screen but it's effectively a single user pod for the, the realize that people may not be able to see it you'll see it in the show notes with a link to it single user pod it can kind of extend outside to kind of cut you off from the rest of the office and allow you a bit of focus time but it's got built-in speakers it's got some uh mood lighting that's got within there and really is one of the best looking examples i've seen of yeah, yeah there's quite a few of those pods around but really nice looking example i'm gonna cut down um show the video for those watching there and try and describe bits of it uh, as i go through uh and i wish i could turn the audio off there we go let me turn that down at least why is there no mute button on vimeo uh, so apologies for the slightly uh, weird background noise on there but very much showing within there what that concept is and what it could mean in there not just a single pod but having it being dynamic changing the, the lighting i'm guessing that can be linked to, to what's on and screen in terms of the concept being able to really kind of it, it expands out to bring you more within that pod or without and i think this is absolutely fascinating that the office team are looking at this and uh, making it available it's really really quite interesting and it looks fantastic it's interesting the interesting thing about that is that it does have a very large screen it's kind of like hub mm. two size screen that is adjustable to different it's angles the, so you could you could be drawing on Surface it or, studio there it I looks a lot larger shoot, than the Surface yeah studio. you're right that is interesting a lot, yeah. a lot larger um but it doesn't appear to have any video camera and the chair i have to say it lets it down a little bit just looking at that picture <laughs> it looks like a little just a stool which uh, yeah might might not be quite as comfy as you want it to be, um, and it's, but it's I think leaning the, in slightly to get you excited, leaning into the uh, the content there as well. But I think the idea of having that that pod with all of the the kit already there, because a lot of the sort of the the spaces that you see that are single person spaces, they don't have any of the technology there. So mm. it's quite interesting to think where you just turn up and just sign in and. And that's it. You're you're off and, and running, and you're in your in your flow uh, in your flow pod in your flow space. <laughs> yeah. So it's it yeah. Be, that's what everyone yeah. wants, right? <laughs> it's got lights and everything. 
mood lights. Yeah, the interesting one here is that you've got the mood lights and there's something on the kind of the, the back part of it that looks looks almost like That'd a be... nest uh you know the uh the google nest with the temperature control i'm assuming it's not that it's some but it's it appears to be some kind of display you'd be able to book it and check into it and uh yeah yeah and you'd have, you'd have to be able to swipe your card yeah. or something and yeah uh, it looks like a profile image so it's almost like you know this uh, is the person who's, who's got it booked it looks like yeah although yeah. it's very small um i think i, I think mean, it's I interesting think you know we you know sorry yeah when, when we're talking to talking about hybrids, you know, this is about the first thing that we've actually seen that is, well, actually, let's reimagine how that space looks completely rather than, oh, well, let's think about the hardware that we put into it and how we rearrange the desks. Mm. You know, it's quite, I think there might be more of these on their way. This but just a change in how we think about space and managing it. It's also a step up for Microsoft. You know, they, they obviously had the Surface devices as the hardware, but you know, this is getting into the the workspace, that the physical workspace on there. And I know they talk about Teams rooms and things, but all that hardware. Yeah, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, all that hardware is non Microsoft stuff. Yes, you can have the Surface Hub two and things, but when it comes to Team rooms, speakers, the kind of collaborative areas, the Microsoft hasn't moved into that space. This. Yes, it's very much a concept and no guarantee this will ever get to market. This could be the Courier Mark II, but um, interesting. Maybe they, need a, maybe they need a partnership with Ikea. <laughs> yes. Oh, that's an idea. Yeah. It, it'd be interesting, though. I think, I don't know, maybe you thought, OK, this is this is back to work and this is office stuff. Maybe this could just you could just drop that into a room in your house. <laughs> there you are. You've got a closed working space. All, all you need, <laughs> all you need is, a sh- is a shed around it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, it would need a lot more than that to keep my kids out and block out the noise of them. To be honest, <laughs> my noise cancelling headphones struggle with that, and and two doors, and I can still often hear them. So, uh, I, I like what you're saying there, Gary, but no, not a chance. <laughs> But yeah, Maybe I thought it was very care. interesting. <laughs> yeah. um, my, my house is also, in fact, I do have a pod like that. My my wife is making a uh, Santa's Grotto for the school. Um, she's making it for Santa because Santa is going to be come to visit and he wants to feel at home before anyone asks. Um, if kids are listening, Santa is, yes, come to visit there. And I'm sure he's come to visit other places as well. Um, but yes, it's all neatly decorated. I, I might give her that and say, can you can you make it look like that afterwards and we can reuse it better for the planet that way. <laughs> um, good, good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on to other news. Um, when there isn't much news, you kind of look back at things that happened in the past and think, oh, are these going to happen again? And it is back to antitrust time. And someone complained to the EU about Microsoft bundling things and being anti competitive within there. Uh, this time, the target seems to be OneDrive and uh, the, the fact that OneDrive's bundled with Windows uh, and Nextcloud. I think it was one of 30 who are bringing together an antitrust suit. Uh, against Microsoft. Can't see it on this article, but another article I saw uh, mentioned that and going to the EU and trying to get OneDrive unbundled, which will be interesting. I I did hear some people talking about Teams as well, which I, I would have thought would be more of a target, especially with the new personal Teams. But um, yeah, be interested to see if we're opening into those browser wars, as it says, the 90s browser wars and various other antitrust cases, whether these will make something um, from it. I don't know. Yeah, you'd think there'd be a Good lesson enough. that would be taken away from from those previous cases to go. Yeah, let's just make sure we can install it all as separate components um, and just make it easy to have a choice. I can't remember seeing a, a choice about browsers for a long time. But no, that's true. Well, it's because it's all Chrome. It's just got different badges. That's well, true. And may, and yeah. maybe that's you know maybe that's it. Um, so. You know whether the uh, whether this is something that only affects the personal version or the business version. Mm. It's probably going to be both, and they're probably going to end up going. Oh well, actually, yeah, you do have Teams bundled in there. You know, maybe we should get rid of that and bring back Skype. You know, it's <laughs> uh, I don't know. It's it's an inter- it's an interesting one. People are always going to complain when 
you know their product isn't actually placed as prominently you know as and, as I mean, anybody else's you know it's just the way it goes isn't it i don't believe i'm the only person who saw this article went what on earth's next cloud so as advertising and marketing going they're not doing a bad job by putting that uh, antitrust complaint to uh, get a bit of publicity as well yeah you know things like dropbox and google drive you know it would be interesting to find out what the proportion of people who actually still use a, a windows device or just use a tablet or a mobile device and what they actually use because i think there's you know if you've got a windows device you're probably using more microsoft products if you've got an android device then you're probably using more google products um an apple probably using more apple products oh well, apple you're not gonna have a choice are you but you know <laughs> Well, funny, funny well, I was I was just but, thinking about you, that because with with Apple you've got the save to files, but the files makes it quite easy to add other things to it. Are, and if I compare are, it with Windows, you know, you have to install something separate. It's not uh, here's a button to add an alternative storage. I suppose you do have that with Teams and things, but mm. generally it's not it's not so obvious in Windows how to add additional things. Yeah, and maybe that's all they need. Yeah. Choose, choose your, your storage. Choose your storage engine. Do you want Google, <laughs> Dropbox, or OneDrive personal or OneDrive business? And and Nextcloud. Or, oh, sorry. Or Nextcloud or E, all of the above. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But yeah. The last time this kind of happened, though, Windows or well, Microsoft released the N version of Windows 10, which was to kind of comply with these uh, laws. So you had Windows 10 N, which then didn't have, you know, all these things bundled. So you wouldn't be in trouble. You then had to make the decision to download things. Um, I mean, you could argue, like, maybe that should be a standard, but that was what was released. So I wonder if another thing is going to happen. I've not actually seen if there is an N version of Windows 11 yet, but mm. yeah. I don't even know whether there was an maybe N we'll version of Windows 10. Arrive. Yeah, I don't think it was. Yeah. yeah. Was it actually was made available? It was. Yeah, I believe so. It's obviously very popular. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I've, yeah, I've had yeah. Microsoft devices for the last last however many years that uh, I guess they didn't you put the N version on them. <laughs> you buy a Microsoft yeah. device, then you get the uh, But the I, I was thinking version. when they had the original browser wars, it was such a pain in the backside when you first installed it and you had to go through making all these choices. And it was like, actually, I don't want all these different ones. And they'd often try to move the, the kind of standard ones off a bit. Uh, as well, because I think it was Microsoft way of saying, well, let's not push people towards Google. Let's put the ones people probably won't choose up front. So hopefully they scroll to the Microsoft ones. But it was, yeah, I thought it was worse. So ho hopefully this doesn't make the experience worse for the consumer and does make it better. Moving on before I start getting ranty as well. Um, other little bit of news, which is probably more for the more developer focused people, but the uh, Azure Functions 4.0 preview has got .NET 6 support. And in fact, actually, I missed a slightly old article, but the update is it's now generally available. So you can uh, run your Azure Functions using .NET 6. Why should people care about that who don't love just going for the shiniest things for the sake of it? Um, it's quicker is the short answer. I think with the combined, you don't have to think about, is it .NET Framework? Is it .NET Core? It's all combined into one thing now. Uh, the performance of .NET 6 is fantastically faster. Uh, and I, there are some new functions and things within there. So um, really, really nice to see that and uh, making things easier uh, as well. So not going to dwell on that too much because I think another article that really caught my eye around .NET 6 and that last one was purely an excuse to talk about this was um, Scott Hanselman. If you don't know, if you ever get the chance and see Scott Hanselman at a conference, please go and see him. Doesn't matter what he's talking about. He's fantastic. Uh, really funny uh, the way he puts things uh, across. You may have seen him. We, we've talked about him before at the uh, was it Ignite or Builds when he did the keynote. Um, he's done a few of those. So very deadpan humour. Um, well worth watching. Um, but he was talking uh, in his blog that he wrote back in 2001. Um, a C sharp app called the tiny virtual operating system and he moved it to vb.net in 2002 but what he's done now is from the .net upgrade assistant to migrate that to .net 6 which 
I think is really quite impressive. And then I, th I think, Gary, you noted and then ran it on uh, Linux in Docker and on a Raspberry Pi. So he's kind of had this project that's now 20 years old um, with just a few lines has managed to upgrade that to the latest .NET framework version and, and have it run. If anyone is listening, not all project upgrades are quite as easy as that just before anyone gets excited, <laughs> but it can be done. And I think I think Microsoft seeing that of trying to make it easier to upgrade legacy things and, and make them work better. Um, but I thought that was really quite cool. Everyone's nodding. OK, nothing to say. I like this. <laughs> it's it's reusing what you've already got, right? It's not having to just kind of completely throw everything away, start from scratch and then figure out, OK, well, did it do this and did it do that? It, it's, you know, same technology, uh, I guess, taking it all the way through the steps. Uh, I quite like the story of it running on pretty much every operating system out there um, as well. Uh, again, shows kind of it's funny how we were talking about kind of like, oh, you know, anti-competition and things and the world as it was before, where it was just like, you know, just you one operating system or, or you, well, in three camps. Now it's it's much more merged. I mean, we've got Linux running on Windows uh, with WSL. Um, you know, it's, it's crazy to say, you know, how far that's progressed in what, just short of, 20 years from what that article's posted well yeah 20 years going from the actual day uh, the year of uh, actually uh the project that was that was created uh i think you said 2001 there so you know in yeah. that space of time um we've gone from yeah um you know all in one to uh, it's everyone's got a choice and let's face it it just validates the the fact that you don't need to actually document this stuff because you can just upgrade it now <laughs> perfect um, one important note on this, this .NET upgrade will not work with Access. So no, your old Access projects do need to be got how, rid of. How do you know? <laughs> I just migrated it to... Uh, I, I'm goodness. not going to dig into this. <laughs> yeah. oh. I don't know, but please just get rid of Access. It's better that way. Sorry, Access lovers, I'm, I'm going to sound like I'm hating on you, but um, yeah, I am. Um, Moving on quickly before we lose uh, too many more people. Uh, it's a nice bit of news. I think this is from a few weeks back, um, but I haven't mentioned before that if I think we've talked before about having the Microsoft 365 developer program so you can have your instant sandbox uh, E5, 25 users gets renewed every three months as long as you're using it. Um, but Al, you, you noticed some something new and exciting with it. Teams, teams sample data pack. So I put in more Teams information in there. So you got just an additional an additional data set in there now to to test with. Which, Which I realise, you know, that you know maybe I'm not actually developing that much, so I don't really use the developer <laughs> tenants. So I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna get in there quickly and say that before we do. Yeah. <laughs> As I was going to say, uh, we, we were debating before the show how, how new all this is, because um, as my, boom, sorry, for all of us, when we were part of a Microsoft partner before two of you deserted, um, we, we had the CDX programs and we could spin up um, sandbox environments from that. And it was very easy to add uh, data packs to that. Now, because of that, I, I'm not entirely sure when they added this to the developer program. Gary, you think it was a little while back that you could add the users and the SharePoint side of things and what, what's new here is just Teams. Yeah, definitely. From from what I've, I've had a developer tenant for, for years, um, I think it was round around the switch over that it used to be that you had a 12 month um, dev tenant and then it would disappear. Um, they brought in the role in three monthly, uh, I guess, subscription uh, that would just keep working if you kept it active um, and at the time the data packs were, were added in so the very first one was mail uh, sorry it was users and then mail and they slowly started to add extra ones in there um, of which the latest is is teams so um, but I think you know uh, whether it's brand new or not I think it's still good to have that there as a as a alternative um, you know if you're if you're in a dev team you really want to have you know your own dev environments where you can just muck around with them yeah use a, a centralized environment to you know integrate all your changes um so this just helps you know get up to speed quickly from 
your own personal dev environment, get test data in there, test users, you know, how many times is it? Oh, uh, yeah, I've, I've tested it with one user who happens to be an admin and can, you know, can do everything, but have you tested it with a read-only user? Well, that would mean I'd have to create users and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, it's an extra task that you've got to do, which um, is, is, is maybe not the priority. Maybe the priority is to get the functionality done, whereas this just makes it a little bit easier to, you know, properly test the scenarios and, and have something repeatable, more, more importantly. So if you do, you know, have something that, that goes a bit of a miss or you, you know, completely bomb your tenant, then, uh, yeah, just spin up another. Wipe it, start again. Yeah. yeah. And in fact, I did that with with mine not that long ago. And I thought the team's won. No, it must have been without the Teams pack for it. Um, and I just wiped my old one. In fact, it was one of the E3 ones. So wiped it, created a new one. Uh, I think it was about half an hour later, I had a brand new environment with a whole load of data in there. It was, yeah, it was like, oh, fantastic. Start again now. And, and and I think also it's not just for developers. Um, I probably should say it is targeted at developers. But if you're looking to do kind of the um, security and compliance stuff, then you get some content in there as well that you can yeah. try out for security and compliance and things like that too. Yeah. yeah, I think you know, even even when you're learning, you know, it's a great resource to test yeah. test configurations, knowing that you can actually undo them. Which, yeah. let's face it, in most production or even you know official dev and test environments, you may not want to uh, you may not want to try them. It's a disposable environment, isn't it? Maybe that's a chat for a future show. Oh, should we use this for all our dev environments? We don't need a dev tenant anymore. But hold that thought because I know we've had that debate before, Al. So uh, maybe have that in a future show as well. Um, one last little article um, just going to share because that was a great community one from Liam Cleary uh, is an MVP talking about performing static code analysis on PowerShell modules and, and scripts. So uh, I'm sure many of you do lots of PowerShell. Uh, I'm sure quite a few of you also don't test it particularly well as well. So uh, having some of the static rules of things to do and make sure that your, your scripts not just work once, but will continue to work and be supportable by others. Um, I thought it was really nice. Uh, some of all the different things you can get done so uh well worth a read for you um powershell people out there i really um, like that i'm just going to say uh, recently mm -hmm. i've been been working with uh i guess you know people writing powershell scripts who are uh, you know, they would say i'm not a dev right so i don't need to well i thought maybe do a bit of source control but it's you know scripting and, and admins kind of style stuff if you like it the source control and DevOps is the dev stuff, right? Um, and I think, you know, <clears throat> I've kind of um, uh, kind of been saying, you know, source control and everything, getting things into DevOps, it, it's, it's, it shouldn't just be seen as a dev skill. It's, it's something that is the start of a lot of things. And by introducing things like this, this is a great way of, of being able to introduce people who are, have not kind of gotten to that source control side of things because, you can have have these analyzed in there to make sure that the quality of the scripts are being that are being created are, are, are kept high, right? That you can have those kind of uh, pull requests and have a simple build that just runs these uh, these uh, analyzer rules against them, and it will instantly pick up things and, uh, and challenge the you know the script writer to go, oh yeah, actually. I just covered something that I didn't know of before, a particular rule, and, and you'll go in and look at that. That'll help you improve and, and learn, uh, um, you know, other techniques uh, for, uh, for for writing your PowerShell scripts. But the end result, right, is better quality scripts that then other people can kind of take on. And you're adding those guardrails in um, uh, as well. So, um, yeah, I think that's that's good. I've not seen that with PowerShell before, but it's a nice, uh, nice addition, definitely. Yeah, I was, I was just thinking actually, Paul Bullock, if you're listening, that might be a nice thing to uh, any deployment process you have for the PMP script samples, which I know you look after, and we'll put a link in the show notes. Um, that might be quite nice to put in there actually, and add a bit of uh, save him a bit of time from it. So uh, hopefully, I'll remember to mention that to you tomorrow. But if not, well, just mention it to me. <laughs> if you've listened to this um yeah i know as i say the pmp script samples were worth a look if you want some guides on scripts you can use uh, we'll put the link in the show notes for that otherwise I, I think we'll wrap up uh i've managed to get through the whole bit of news without mentioning how upset i am that uh, i'm not at the collab summit uh today because there's an amazing number of people there and enjoying themselves damn them all 
um, but hopefully be there for the next one. And uh, do keep a lookout. Uh, hopefully by the time this is published, uh, actually no, just after that, we'll know who all these uh, speakers are for the Scottish Summit. So if you haven't signed up for Scottish Summit, February 25th to yep. 26th i think off the top of my head certainly so whatever the the friday and saturdays around there there'll be some workshops uh do get on and make sure you sign up because i think it is filling up pretty quickly uh, and it's getting a uh, very popular so uh sign up it is a hybrid event so if you can't make it over to glasgow uh, it will be on alt vr and uh you can join in there and join in all the sessions as well so uh if you really can't make it and see all the fantastic people i know they've announced that donna Sarka is going to be doing the closing keynotes which will be fantastic there's an accessibility hackathon lots of going on and there will be iron brew uh, as well so um well worth keeping out an eye out for the sessions when they're announced there um other thing just to wrap up i mentioned we had the comments from phil worrell please do if you have enjoyed the show i don't like to do this every time but please do go back give us a rating um whatever your podcast provider uh, choices give us a rating send us a comment send us a tweet send us each of individual message we do love the feedback let us know what's been interesting uh what isn't uh it does help and we do try and listen to as many of the comments as possible uh, otherwise we'll wrap up the news and uh listen out for next week as we come back to you to talk about design thinking otherwise thank you very much bye-bye